Okay, good, good morning. I'm hoping that some of my presentation will actually answer some of the questions that have just arisen. Our land, our people, our story. Was the effort, I've already missed one, sorry. It's gone up, it's gone too far. Go back one. <laughs> I think there's two to take. Oh, was the effort um, to transform a ugly, derelict, concrete, reinforced concrete bunker into a state of the art new museum? It took eight years, more than eight years. It took more than 2.4 million pounds. How I'm going to talk about it in 20 minutes? Well, I'll do my best. Who am I? Uh, my background obviously is not Scotland at all. I was a history teacher in the south of England for 30 years. I got pretty tired. I stopped bouncing. So in 2002, I took a deep breath. I resigned my job. I sold my house. And I came up to the Northwest Highlands of Scotland. I always say for man and mountains, if I'm asked. I don't know which, the, I think I know which the priority was. <laughs> I uh, moved at Old Bay, which is on the shores of Loch U. And it's a huge parish, the parish of Gaelock. Gaelock's about 13 miles south of where I live on the shores of Loch Gaelock. And you think you're remote in our bro, for heaven's sake, come off it. <laughs> Can you see that little blue square at the top left? Right, that's where we are. Um, Inverness is uh, two hours through the mountains, that's our nearest hospital, that's our nearest Marks and Spencers, if that gives you some <laughs> idea of the uh, scale of remoteness. I decided not to go back into teaching, I said I'd have my, a career break, uh, it's turned out to be quite a long one, it hasn't stopped yet. But I uh, took up a job first of all as a volunteer and then as a paid seasonal at Inview Gardens, which is halfway between Ock Bay and um, Gerlach, you, and that's run by the National Trust for Scotland. And as a historian taking guided walks, I wanted to know about the history of the garden and its founder. Started asking questions and actually discovered almost nothing was known. So I took about my research for about six, seven years. I spent virtually all winter sitting in the library of the Gerlach Heritage Museum, 13 miles away, going through every book, every archive folder, everything I could possibly find. And I talked a lot to the volunteers who were there, got their local history. I found out how the place worked. In 2007, they invited me onto their committee. In 2009, they invited me to be their secretary. And I haven't got away since. I'm still doing the job to the best of my ability. Um, I did actually write a book about the founder of NVU, but uh, it's a long way away in the past now. The museum itself was started in 1977. It opened in converted steading buildings. The actual foundation of the museum was local people who met to talk about artifacts they had at home, about their photographs, about their memories. But what really enforced the need for a building was that they discovered a Pictish stone in a wall of the local cemetery. I um, don't think Anne McInnes is here, is she? But she'll tell you how you find Pictish stone. She's amazing about it. Um, this Pictish stone was the first one ever found on the west coast mainland. Plenty in the east of Scotland, and none on the west coast mainland. And the logo of that fish, supposed to be a salmon apparently, dead fish on a yellow platter, I thought to start with, has been the symbol of the museum through time. The museum has always been utterly dependent on its volunteers. You can see what the converted steading buildings look like as well. They're pretty rustic. But in the early 1990s, there was enough money to pay a manager part time. And by I think it was 1998, there was enough money to pay a qualified museum professional to be our curator. And that was a huge step forward. And we've managed to maintain that uh, skin of our teeth ever since. The museum collection expanded considerably and became much more prestigious when this wonderful Fresno lens was saved from being thrown into the sea in 1986. The Northern Lighthouse Board was automating its lighthouses. The Ruray Lighthouse is on the coast north of Gerloch, still there. Um, and they decided they had no use for personal lens, and local people discovered to their horror what was being planned to do with it, so they rescued it. 
They didn't have space inside the museum, it's too big. And so they raised funds for an extension. You can see it in the back left of this picture. It's the idea is off the top of the lighthouse. And so the first all ends was, was installed in this purpose-built extension. Boats were collected, carts were collected. We had a foghorn as well somewhere. We smartened up the front of the museum quite a lot. And on the right, you can see the library that was built, which is where I spent an awful lot of time. Inside, the museum was very much open set. There was very little in the way of display cases. Uh, there was a blacksmith. There was an illicit still in a cave with a very spooky looking man. Uh, there was a schoolroom. Press the right button. No, sorry, thank you. So, there was a re uh, reinstated shop, one that had closed down from the area. And there was a much loved croft house built in situ. And many, many, many of the early artifacts that people have collected can be seen in this picture with another spooky lady sitting by the fireside. But by the time I was involved, the museum really was chock-a-block. There was just no space to do anything. And in fact, there was so little space that we had to close the collection. We, we literally could not take any more artifacts. They're nowhere in store, we couldn't display them. That's a bit of a disaster for a museum. It means you can't change very much. We had no toilets. We had no area for groups for any sort of activities. I say it was cold and damp in the winter. It was pretty cold and damp in the summer as well because the roof was very leaky. And worst of all for us, our lease was due to expire in 2015. In 2000, that didn't seem too disastrous, but I was part of quite a few of them. Talks with the landlord to try to buy the whole site were coming to nothing. Um, various old, other old buildings in the parish were looked at. Uh, some, oh, sorry, some architectural plans were made, some feasibility studies undertaken at our expense. Came to nothing. New sites for a new building got nowhere. And by 2011, we were really pretty <clears throat> desperate. Until this fantastic road depot came on the market. Highland Council was building itself a new road depot for its grit and lorries and its dustbins, and it asked for bids for £70,000 for the, the whole site. It was a bit more than just this awful building. Um, I, I was actually at the, the committee meeting when a guy came along and said, any use as a museum? And we sort of thought, oh, <laughs> no way. But it turned out it was actually quite a historic building. A bit more interest shown. That's it. Yep. And it turns out, as not only was it quite, sort of, quite interesting historically, it actually had a real legacy from the Cold War period. It had been built around about 1953 as one of four anti-aircraft operation rooms. The idea was that as uh, Russian bombers came over with their loads of atom bombs to drop on the big cities, the guns left over from the Second World War in our area would shoot them down. And the anti-aircraft <laughs> operation room was going to control this shooting down of... Russian bombers, wonderful. And so it was nuclear bomb proof from the beginning. Okay, now think about that for a museum. It's actually quite useful. <laughs> um, however, Russian technology moved on and their planes flew a bit higher. So they decided <laughs> that they weren't going to manage to shoot them down. So actually, the building was redundant before they ever put in the communications. Everything was there except the communications network. Highland Council decided to make a really good roads depot and they took it on in uh, 1959. In fact, parts of the building were redone up in the 1960s and again in the late 1980s when the Cold War looked like it was becoming a bit hotter. And it was to be the Civil Defence Centre to coordinate the aftermath of the detonation of a nuclear bomb, the radiation, the control centres and so on. And some of you of my vintage might remember Raymond Briggs' When the Wind Blows, the cartoon, the, the film, the play. And that's the atmosphere that this building generates. Okay, ugly, pretty well derelict. What a mess behind. And not much better inside, frankly. If we'd been looking for a museum of road signs, we had 70 years worth to work from. <laughs> But 
it was in a fantastic location. It was on the main road on what was then the Western Ross Coastal Trail, it's now the North Coast 500. Mixed blessing if you live on it, but brilliant for a museum. On the hillside behind, there are lots of archaeological sites, roundhouses and sheep rings. And best of all, for our fundraising purposes, it was in an area that was designated for regeneration. There was already a new building as a tourist office right next door to us. There was social housing, there was new retail development, and this wonderful AAOR Road Depot was the last I saw. And I saw it certainly was. But it has the most amazing views to the island of Skye on a good day. So, where are we up to it? This is one of our early um, architectural drawings. Could we do it? It was a challenge, no doubt. It ticked a lot of funders' boxes, um, sort of an answer to the question a bit earlier, perhaps. Not only was it essential to preserve the heritage of the Gerlock Museum, which was going to have to close if nothing was done pretty soon, but also the heritage of the building. I did the research into the heritage of the building. It, it's quite a strong case. Certainly, it would be beneficial for community groups, particularly the disadvantaged and the elderly. They didn't have anywhere quite like this to go. Uh, another bonus for us was that West Highland College's Adult Education Centre in Gallup was far too small for its purposes. They wanted somewhere bigger. And we had enough space in this new, new building, if we were able to progress it, to offer them the space they wanted. They were brilliant from the start to end. West Highland College, University of Highlands and Islands. They've been real good partners. And yeah, okay, we're remote, but actually a lot of people do come to Wester Ross for its fantastic scenery, even before the North Coast 500, and we could offer a good tourist attraction. Highland Council, from start to finish, have been excellent. I cannot praise them too highly. Highlands and Islands Enterprise, likewise, they gave us money Small sums to start with for development funding, for seeing feasibility studies, initial architect's plans. But most of all, they gave us their time and their expertise. They gave us their time and expertise, their officers. And that was so helpful. Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, I'm not going to call it whatever it is now. I can't remember the name. This is one I know it by. Uh, as could we, as a volunteer-led small community, plan, organise and implement such a project. We held community consultations across the, across the whole parish. What did people want? They made it absolutely clear they wanted their Heritage Museum to continue. Uh, so there were some doubts about the actual building, but if that's all there was on offer, they'd go for it. Um, we created our visions. We had our project plans. We had our themes, our purposes. I'll just leave you to imagine the meetings with stakeholders and partners and potential funders. We were already an accredited museum, one of the first independent museums in the Highlands 2009 to get accreditation. That stood us in really good stead. And in 2013, we made ourselves business-like um, by becoming a company limited by guarantee. All important in terms of getting funders on board. But our first approach to Heritage Lottery, our first application to fund, uh, what they call it, round one funding, was rejected. Basically, they said we were not big enough as an organisation, we didn't have the capacity to deliver a project of this magnitude. Oh wait, okay, it's a long way to Edinburgh from Gerlock. We went, we, I say we bearded the lions in their den, but anyway, we had a pretty strong deputation, including Highlands and Islands Enterprise, including um, our architects who were very prestigious. We said, what have we got to do? And they said, essentially, if you can prove to us that you can do what we would normally ask after we've given you a round one pass, we'll look at your application again. So that's what we did. And they told us also we had to get the letters of support and we had to, most of all, produce the evidence that the funds could be raised. The community said, OK, we go for it. We are not giving up now. We've only got two years now till our lease ends, in theory. We did, in fact, manage to extend the lease, they quadrupled the rent. Okay, more money to raise. No time to go through this, but we had letters of support from across the world, from across Scotland, the Highlands, heritage organisations, National Trust of Scotland, local businesses, can't read them all. 
Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Highland Council kept at us, and do you believe it? Highland Council said, okay, we will sell you that building for a pound. Forget the 70,000. Should have gone, I've missed it. But uh, Her uh, Heritage Lottery Fund in 2015 gave us a go ahead for a round one development phase path. No promises for the future, but we were started. So we confirmed our project professionals, we got our architects and design teams to building drawing up much more complex designs and projections as to how the space would be used. We got all these wonderful drawings of what it would look like, but we're finally in. Um, sort of bore relation to reality, but uh, a bit of artistic license for us. Uh, we had fortunately the staff in place. We had a, a very, very good museum curator. She's still with us. She hasn't given up yet, thank goodness, um, with a background as a lecturer in heritage tourism before she became uh, a professional museum person. And we also got funding for a project curator from 2014 to 2016 to help us write all those plans and project reports. And then there was a year gap, and then we got funding for a learning interpretation officer to deliver the project to its final stages. So two, at any one time, two paid museum professionals. But essentially, the job was being done, a huge amount of work was being done by our board. Nobody gave up. We are all still in it, apart, well, apart from people dying, but that's a bit of a sad story. But essentially, everybody stuck with it. We started with 52 volunteers on our list. We now have 120 in a population of fewer than 2,000. You think our growth is small? We're doing okay. And they were prepared to do anything and everything. Heritage Lottery Fund said, you have got to get community fundraising of 200,000 pounds. That worked out at more than 100 pounds per man, woman, and child. Okay, game on. Uh, we had grand raffles, we had auctions, we had Kayleys. We wrote two books, a recipe book, and then they took a photograph to sell to raise funds. We had garden openings, big and small. We had pub quizzes every month through every winter since uh, 2014, I think. We got lots of people to fund, to, to promise, to pledge money towards a project if we got the go-ahead. Um, some big, some small, but mainly from the local community. We have no industry at all in our area. We've got no businesses. Um, Inverness businesses weren't interested in Gerloff. Two hours away, no way. You're not supporting you. We've got enough of our own to do. So it was all local people. And we asked people to put pots on their windowsills, on their pub counters, on their shops, floors. Every penny counted. By December 2016, we'd got enough money in the pot to promise, for the Heritage Lottery Fund to promise 725,000, but we still had to get the rest of it. And no time to dally, but 20 plus separate funders provided us with money. Probably another 20 turned us down, but never mind. And in December 2017, the diggers came on site. Knocked down all the temporary buildings and all the rubble around the back. Hoardings went up. Holes started to be uh, drilled in the front of the building, two and a half foot reinforced concrete. That was a hard job. It actually delayed things quite a lot. But they managed to make the holes for the windows and the doors. We didn't want windows around the back. The museum doesn't need a window. The roof was a major project, right mess. That was the first big job to be done. Inside, well, okay, that was the challenge there, clear that lot, <laughs> gradually getting it clearer. We didn't want to clear everything, that door is actually quite useful, it's the original blast door for when it, to, against a nuclear bomb exploding, so then we kept that, we've got a display on it now. <laughs> that was the door I meant for it, that one. We took people round the music, uh, around the building that was going to be their museum as often as we could, it was cold. But we had a huge amount of support. I think we ran six tours that, that day. We wanted to rebuild the Croft House, so we had to get the stone in before most of the work was done inside. And uh, councils, environmental people weren't happy about the weight, but reinforced concrete, no problem. Croft House gets being built. 
That's it before the thatching went on the roof. We kept the old museum going till October of last year. The minute the door shut, we dismantled the lighthouse lens, frame by frame, screw by screw, and put it back in situ in the <coughs> new museum. Took down the sets, packed the boxes, and started working inside. That's the personal lens beginning to be installed, gradually other bits all around it. Eventually, come spring this year, the designers were on site putting the, the um, panels up, installing the goods. That's a listening post for listening to Gallic. Volunteers put the finishing touches on the personal lens. Our volunteers were trained. We had volunteers as desk, reception desk, tour guides, room stewards, who need to learn their book. We had a film being made, taking the memories of local people, 25 minute film, including their photographs, outside, being tidied up, and eventually the sign went on the wall. This was June of this year. Inside we have stunning displays and galleries. This is an actual world display. We reinstalled the shop and the school and the croft house. Behind the scenes, we've got state of the art, racking and storage. We put in the exhibition that was going to be on show for the first time. We've got quite a strong art and artist support. And on the 1st of July, we were ready to open. 9th of July, it was wet. Princess Anne came along, our curators delighted behind. And Princess Anne spent a lot of time talking to our volunteers. It was brilliant. And since then, not with, what's the situation? We've had lots and lots of visitors exceeding our best, highest expectations. We've made sure there's lots for children to do. That's a magnetic jigsaw done by a local artist, Ch uh, grinding corn on a quern. Yeah, Margaret sorry. comes out from Applecross every week to tell people about spinning. We've had an artist doing a series <coughs> of evening sessions with people drawing from the museum's collection. We've done walks from the museum. We've had children in from the primary schools. We've hosted all sorts of different events. We've had the most amazing feedback. This is the best Wii Museum ever. This is when I really think strikes a chord for this conference, a community proud of its past. These are some of the people who've helped do the job. They got some just, you know, some reward for their efforts. But without them, there would never have been a new Gallop Museum. That is the story of our land and our people, very briefly. Thank you.